We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Well, as you can tell, if you're looking this way, Pastor Gabe is not here this morning. He just got back from a, a trip, a reach trip to Peru, and so you're going to hear more about that just in a little bit. But what you do have today, today is... Uh, the honor and pleasure to hear from Amber over here. Um, Now, Amber's been on staff at The Point for five years, at The Point for seven, and Amber has served in a number of roles here. And I I was actually thinking backstage, you've done just about everything here. Uh, You've worked with the kids, with groups, discipleship. You've never done worship. No, you don't want me on the worship team. Can we get her an audition? (laughs) No. Um, I failed already. (laughs) But one thing that's always been Amber's greatest passion since I've known her uh, has been missions and and what God is doing among the nations. And and for that reason, Amber uh, is our international reach director. And today, you're going to hear all about uh, what God is doing among the nations. And so we're just going to jump right in, if that's good with you guys. Uh, Let's welcome Amber here this morning. Come on. So we've got to establish like a baseline uh, of what missions is because, you know, if we all come from different church backgrounds or different churches have different ideas about missions, can you just set the record straight? What does the Bible say about missions? And tell us why missions are important. Okay. So I want to start with saying when I very first started attending the point, I remember Pastor Gabe saying something that really stuck with me. He still says it now, so you probably heard it. But he says, um, any vision that doesn't include reaching the world for Christ is just too small right? God has a vision for reaching the world. And so if we have God's vision, it has to include that. Otherwise, it's too small of a vision for our personal lives and for us as a church. Um, But in thinking about this and preparing for today, I thought of a story that I'd like to share that for me made missions really come alive. You know, I had, at this point, I had been on mission trips, taking classes on missions, all kinds of different things. But there was one day on a trip, it was a point trip to the Philippines in 2017 that God really opened my eyes to a new understanding of what missions is. So I'm going to share that with you. So it started with four people from the point, myself, Jen Buxton, Zach Pugh, Rich Newsom. We got on a plane and then another plane and then another plane. It takes a long time to get to the Philippines. If you have not been there, there's at least one 15-hour plane ride in the process. <clears throat> so we got there and we um, met our ministry partners that we're going to work with that are called the ATA Bible Study Center. And the ATA people are the unreached people that are also the outcasts of the Philippine society. So they're the Aborigines people Um, they look different. They're a little shorter, curly hair. You can kind of pick them out. And because of that, um, they mostly live up in the mountains, kind of keep to themselves. So they can't get education, healthcare, things like that. In fact, it's so bad that a lot of Filipinos would even say these people don't have souls. Okay. So our ministry partner is working with these churches. So they showed us all these different villages that week. And so the first day, we go to a village, and so we start by driving an hour or two, get to the end of a paved road, and then we come to this lake. And I think there's a picture of it for you guys so you can kind of picture. So we get on the lake, and so the paved road is gone, and it's time to cross the lake. Those are our transportation. And it's actually kind of funny because I remember we piled in the Americans and the Filipinos, and there was a lot more Filipinos in the one boat than ours, and they were laughing at us, you know, American travel versus Filipino travel but um so we started traveling across this lake and as you could tell from the picture it's not speedy transportation right so it was a slow journey and so it was absolutely gorgeous like I was just sitting there taking it in and thinking how beautiful if this spot wasn't in the U.S. it'd be like million dollar property you know resort and so I was enjoying it but as we were traveling they started telling us the story of this lake And so this lake is in the area of Mount Pinatubo. And if you're familiar with Mount Pinatubo, in 1991, it erupted. And it wiped out huge amounts of the Philippines, slid down mountains, wiped out communities. And so this area that we were in, you could still see like sand everywhere from long ago when that happened. And they shared with us this lake we were crossing didn't exist before that volcano. So the eruption caused 
this lake to form. And they were saying right out under where we're traveling right now was a village with a church and people. And it struck me, this destruction, right? Like the, this place of mass destruction, something so beautiful at one time was a tragedy. And God reminded me in that moment of Isaiah 61, where it talks about God takes ashes and he makes them into something beautiful. And it struck me again, sitting there like, only God can do that. Only God can take the broken places of my life and turn them into something beautiful. Only God is hope for the world, right? And so I want to read to you guys from Isaiah 61. And this should sound familiar if you were here last week because Pastor Gabe spoke about it. And it's the ministry of Jesus. And we know it's the ministry of Jesus because Jesus himself said in the New Testament, when I came, I'm fulfilling these words. So just this is what Isaiah 61 says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Only God can take the broken and make it beautiful. And that's what missions is all about. It begins with what God's doing in me and how he's transforming me. And then as he transforms me, I have something to give other people. I and part of the ministry of Jesus, reaching out to others. And it doesn't, we don't have to look far to see brokenness, right? We can look in our own lives, our homes, our communities. And when I've traveled several places in the world this year, and you just look and you think, what can I even do? How can I even make a difference? But the beauty of the gospel is in the darkest places, the light shines the brightest. In those broken, hurting places, only God can heal. Um, so as we cross this lake, I'm thinking through all this, and then we get out, and we're not quite there yet. So we have a hike up a mountain, about an hour, hour and a half, we hike up the mountain. So by the time we got to the top, I was very tired because I'm not in the best shape, and so it's a little good, vigorous exercise. And we get to the top, and we get to this village area, and um, way past electricity, running water, you know, just kind of like thatch huts in this area. And the pastors that we were with begin to do ministry to the people. So they gather them in this little lean-to, you know, four poles with a kind of roof. Yeah, so, like, yeah. how many people live in this village? Um, from where we were, you could probably see four, five, six homes, but probably 75 people or so were there. So they're coming from all these different places. And the only way to get there is to drive, walk, go over a, a lake, lake in a canoe and then with hike. stabilizers and then hike. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and there was an ox cart that brought the rice up the mountain for us. Okay. Yeah, so. Hi. Exciting transportation. So, yeah, sounds yeah. like it. So we were there, and I was watching these pastors, and what I saw that day was I saw how Jesus did ministry. And it reminded me of the feeding of the 5,000, where it says, like, all the broken and the distressed people, they came to Jesus, and he taught them, and he fed them. And that's exactly what these pastors did. They taught them, and they fed them. Now, I didn't speak the language, and I think we were quite a sight to these Filipino people who don't see a lot of other Filipinos, much less a bunch of Americans, so they were a little scared of us. But one thing that was really amazing is the rice that was being distributed from these pastors happened because of this church. So I was sitting there thinking about that. We as a church, because of the generosity of our people, we gave, and these people had a practical tool to see God's love because of a church in Charlottesville, Virginia. And here we are in this remote place in the Philippines and God is partnering us together to reach these people. Yeah, and that's, that's like a wild thought when you think about it. Yeah, that like, it's really amazing. What, what's happening right here, put rice in a family's table in the, in the Philippines, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's amazing. So that they can hear the gospel. Yeah. Um, and so I got back that night or the next morning and I started reading through Isaiah 61 because I don't have it memorized. So I was like, oh, I want to read. What does God say? And um, it's interesting as you read through the chapter, it talks about how God goes from restoring us to having us become the restorers. So it talks about God's people restore the ancient cities. But it ends with verse 11 and I want to read it. It says, for as the garden brings forth its sprouts... 
I mean, sorry, as the earth brings forth its sprouts and a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. See, the ministry of Jesus is connected to the nations, right? So it begins with us and his healing in us, but it extends out to the nations. And God is doing something all over the world. His work is springing up everywhere. And the cool thing is he lets us be a part of it. And it's pretty amazing. So um, let me just share one quote to end this thought. And this is from um, Eugene Patterson. And he's talking about how the gospel is supposed to be practical. A lot of times I think church is a thing we do, we read, we say, but we don't let it work its way into our lives. But the gospel is real and it's supposed to change us and change other people. So this is what he says. Christians don't simply learn or study or use scripture, we assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name. That's an awesome quote. I'm like sitting here feeling even just convicted because I haven't been on a mission strip in like a decade. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to you after the service. We'll get you connected. (laughs) So let's talk about what God is doing to reach the nations through the point. Now, I've been on staff now for over five years. And I remember in the beginning when I came on staff, we had Guatemala, the village project. And I remember a couple times a year, we'd have the team on the stage and we'd pray over them. And it seems like in the last 12 months, like every two or three weeks, we're praying over a team. And so I... I know that God is doing some pretty cool stuff, and, and yeah. we're, we're in way more than just Guatemala now. But right. why don't you take a few minutes and um, tell us all just about what, where, the point is, is, where the point is among the nations right okay. now. So if you've been at the point for any length of time, you have heard Pastor Gabe talk about our vision for reaching the nations. But I want to say it just in case you've forgotten or you're new. It's that by our 50th year as a church, we will be active in 50 countries. Now, I remember the first time Pastor Gabe told me this, and because I was overreach, I was trying to, you know, what does that mean, and what is it going to look like? So I started asking him questions. Do you mean in 50 years we'll have been in 50 countries, or do you mean we'll be active in 50 countries? And we know what the answer is, right? Whatever the bigger vision is, that's what we're going to do because God has called us to that. And just for some context, we're in year nine. Right. So we got 41 to see this vision through. Right. So in 2017, we were active in three countries, and we went on a vision trip for our fourth. By the end of this year, we have now, we're active partnerships in eight countries. So that's pretty cool. God is doing big things. and so. I recently returned from Liberia, and when I got back, I felt the Lord really speak to me and say, slow down and appreciate what I've done. Like, don't miss what I'm doing, because it's so easy to go and come back and just rush back into everyday life. And that's true for mission trips. It's true every day. God is doing so many things we have to be grateful for and to rejoice in, and sometimes we just miss it. So this morning, what I want to do is share a little bit about the eight countries and This could go on for a really long time, but so we're going to do like the flyby version. So it'll be a lot of information really fast, but I want you to see what is God doing and how is God using our church? Because it's really incredible when you stop and think about it. So we just want to rejoice in all that God's done this year and what he's going to do in the future. Okay, so we're going to start with Guatemala. Our partnership with Guatemala, as Dave mentioned, is our longest standing partnership. We partner with a ministry called Hope of Life. Hope of Life works with different churches from the U.S. and partners them with villages in Guatemala to do what we call village transformation. This year, we got to start our second village. So we're in a village called Timiluya, and you probably heard us pray about that a few weeks ago. But what really struck me as the team was sharing about this village is that Another church had been partnered with this village before, and they started going in and working and talking, and then they had a pull out. And so that broke trust. Not just trust with Americans or churches, but with God, I believe, you know? And so our church, we're going in and we're reestablishing them and showing them that we have a God who cares about them, who sees them, who loves them and doesn't forsake them, right? And so on this last trip, our team was able to help do school repairs. So a very practical way. They spent time and just said, God sees. So that's what's happening. A little recap of Guatemala. Second country we started working in is Cuba. And if you were here this summer, you heard our partner from Cuba talk um, from Go and Tell Ministries. 
And our um, big vision to help them is they want to build a ministry center in a community called Los Pinos to minister to the people of Cuba. And so we're helping them with that building project and donating to that. But a little like our building project, there's some red tape in the process. So um, A little bit. A little yeah. bit, yeah. yeah. You know that feeling where we're waiting every Sunday for them to say, we broke ground? Well, that's what the people of Cuba, they're waiting for that permission to get the project. And they've been able to do a little bit, but... I think what's really cool is our partner, Victor, has said, as you're bringing teams, what you're doing is you're doing ministry with our people and our church and preparing us for that big vision and ministry that God's going to do. So we're building. And when I think of Cuba, I think of one word, encouragement. Um, I was telling the first service, I remember on this, my last trip to Cuba being in a lady's home. So we do a lot of visits to the elderly and the sick. And she said, you know, it means so much that you're here because even the people that live right around me don't come to my house. And you came all the way from the U.S. and you're sitting here taking time to listen to me and pray with me. And just spending time with people and praying for them is a lot of what we do in Cuba. And it's an amazing opportunity to share God's love. Um, third one is the Philippines. So we started the Philippines, which we mentioned. Um, this year, we sent two teams in January, and so our teams got to go into a village called Marasa. Now, I got to go to this village when I was there, and let's just say it takes a long time to get there. The pastors we're with, they normally would walk there, and they would say it takes about eight to 10 hour walk, right? So that's past the paved road, eight to 10 hour walk. We got high class treatment, and we rode in a World War II weapon carrier. Right, so it only took us two or three hours past the paved road, but we got out there, and one of the most amazing things I've ever seen is we were in this village in the middle of the middle of nowhere, and 20 people got baptized that day. Wow, that's incredible. So like wow. the church, yes, amen. So the church is alive and active in Marasa, and so they, at that time they had kind of a little, little church building made out of thatch and those type of things, and our team was able to go in and build a bigger building with cinder block and just support them, and they actually like camped out in the village for a couple days, so... It's really cool. And this January, when we send teams again, they're going to build a church in another village similar to that. The next ministry we um, started with is Nicaragua. So I was able to visit Nicaragua with a few people about this time last year, a ministry called Feed My Lambs. We were unable to go this year because of... Um, there was a travel ban to Nicaragua, a lot of um, civil unrest. But this ministry is reaching out to children. So they're sharing the gospel, but in, as their name implies, feed my lambs. They're feeding children physically and then sharing the gospel. Um, I remember in particular one little girl that I met there. Her name was Hennessy's. And um, she showed me her home. She had little bunnies and all this kind of stuff. And they were telling me about her. She's such a good student and she's a hard worker. And she's one of the lives that's being impacted by this ministry because they go into her area and her school and do feeding all the time and share the gospel. And there's a lot of children who are poor, yes, but they also don't have the love that they need. So this amazing ministry, and hopefully this year we'll be able to take a full team there. The next one um, we started in is Peru. Peru, we're partnering with a ministry called Peru River Ministries. And you recognize that guy in the picture, right? So um, Pastor Gabe has been, he's there for his second time this week and doing pastoral training. So this um, ministry is going down the Amazon River to the unreached people and planting churches. And so Pastor Gabe and a few guys from the point were able to be a part of that. And as a church, we were able to pay for those pastors to be able to come and get trained to reach even more people. So exciting things. And then we had three places this year we went for the first time. So vision teams. Um, one, well, actually, we went Peru, too, so I guess it's four, but Mexico. So we went to Mexico this summer to a ministry called Seed Time and Harvest, and they're working in the area that's heavily influenced by the drug cartel. And so these are some tough people that are working with this ministry, and they're so bold and strong. But we, um, while we were there, one thing we did was the guys on the team helped build a church. And there's a picture, he might have already shown it, but of us. And we're standing in that building project and we're praying. And this building, this church building, is in a neighborhood that's across from one of the largest gang neighborhoods in this area of Mexico. And it's mostly people that have been kicked out of the cartel. So they're mostly squatters, very, very poor, very dangerous 
But in that church, when we were praying over it, I will tell you, out of this whole year, one of the most powerful moments I felt God moving this whole year, you could just feel God's presence there. And these people had such a love for the kids and for the outreach. And God is doing big things in Mexico. And it was great just to see a little piece of that. Um, then Togo. So we talked about this a few weeks ago. We just started a um, partnership with a ministry in Togo called African Kids Evangelism Ministries. Now, this is so amazing. They're only four years old as a ministry. They planted a church four years ago. Three years ago, they started a school. It has over 1,000 kids in it. I'm telling you, there was kids everywhere, right? You hear them in the morning, their little rush of voices, and they play the drums to get everybody going in the morning. And you just see all these kids. Well, our partner there, Kojo, he talked to us about um, the need for medical care. So he asked us, could we bring teams of doctors and nurses? And so we did a small team, and in the future, we're going to do medical clinics there. So it's a really amazing opportunity because medical care is very hard to come by. Most people can't afford medicine. And so just to spend time with a doctor who loves and cares for them is a huge um, ministry outreach. And it really enhances the ministry that they're already doing in Togo. And then Liberia. So just got back last Saturday night. So we've been back a little over a week. And this was an amazing trip. And there's so many different stories we could tell, but we work with a ministry called Petals of Hope. So Petals of Hope works with young girls and it, they have a school for girls. Now in Liberia, women are not treated well. And especially young girls are very vulnerable. So most people can't afford an education, but on top of that, it's not safe for these young girls to go to school. So they've started this school that gives them dignity, education, shares with them about God's love. And I had actually went there a year ago, and I was so amazed to get to see them reciting verses and saying scripture and singing to God, and you just see the impact that this ministry has. So we were able to spend time with the students and the teachers, but one really cool opportunity is God allowed our team, especially um, one guy who has plumbing experience, to work with the men there to put in a water tower and a water tank and a water source. So this ministry already had put in a well that was the, a main source of water for the community, and now they have running water for the first time that turns on with the spigot, right? So, I mean, it is very cool to watch them for the first time turn on water. And we got at the school, we got to watch the girls see the water turn on for the first time like that. So pretty cool. That's so incredible. And it's something that I know, like, it's so easy to take for granted. Yeah. But over there, like, when you go on the mission field and you see this stuff happening, it's like, to yeah. them, it's, you know... Such it's, a blessing. It's amazing. I know I told the team, because um, we, you know, we use yeah. bucket bucket baths, so to yeah, speak, yeah. flush the toilet with the bucket, and now they have running water wow. that since we've left, they've got it all plumbing into the house. I said, now you can tell the other teams, well, we were here when there was no running water. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I think what she's saying is if you go, you lucked out because right. they have running water now. Yeah, or a few steps up, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so when you were talking about these trips, you were describing things like building. Right, you said the men building and putting these structures up, and then you just shared about medical missions, right? Well, mm -hmm. let's take somebody like me, all right? I don't necessarily build things, right? Like out of concrete. Yeah. And then uh, I also, I think I might pass out if I had to stick someone with a needle. Mm -hmm. So um, no medical for you. Tell me, yeah, tell me, like somebody that's just like wondering today, like. Is, is a mission trip for me. I mean, what do yeah. I have? What do I have? To, I can play guitar. Yeah. I'll go over there. I'll play. I will play my best, like the little drummer boy, rumpa pum pum. I'll do my yeah. best, right? All right. But what? What do people? What do people like myself and like maybe some of you out there? Like when you think about missions, like what? What do I have to offer? Well, I think that's a natural question because I think every trip I go on, I feel like that. Look, Lord, what do I have to offer? But the thing is, it's God working, not us working. And when I look at every one of you, I know something, because God tells me that you are created with a unique purpose and a design, and God has given you a gift to share his love with people. And it looks different for every one of us, but we all have it because we're God's children, right? Um, Pastor Gabe and I were talking similar to this a few days ago, right before he left for Peru, and he was sharing with me about his heart and vision for this church is that Every person who goes to the point and calls the point their home will at some point go on one international trip. It's an awesome vision. So did you hear that, everybody out there? That's your pastor's vision for you. But, but really, if you, he and I have seen 
the impact it has. One, we get to impact the nations, but two, I see the impact that it has on people here. And we sometimes get so caught up in having to know and do and have all the right skills, but I was thinking about like my first trip to Cuba, which was actually my first point mission trip. So my first point mission trip, we were visiting these different homes and I remember going into this one home, this sick, sick lady, and she sat up, looked right at me, said my sister in Christ, except in Spanish, which is some of the few Spanish I can understand, and laid back down. And see, God spoke to her. I didn't have to say anything. She knew I was her sister in Christ there to visit her and share God's love. You just have to show up. Um, yeah. And so, um, and I think of like some of the guys I've been with, one in particular said, you know, I think on this mission trip, I grew more in one week than I've grown in the last year spiritually. Because when you step out, God does big things, right? Um, we have a reach devotion that we do with all the teams, and I've done it several times this year because I've been on several trips. And there's a quote in there that every time I read it, it kind of stops me, makes me pause and think about how God is working in my life and what I should be doing. It's by C.T. Studd, and he says, I belong to the great God party and will have nothing to do with the little God party. Christ does not want nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible, right? Yeah, it's good and convicting. And um, Pastor Gabe wrote that devotion, and he goes on and shares about um, Peter needing to get out of the boat, right? And when he got out of the boat, he walked on water, and he gives this challenge, pray this prayer, God, use me to do the impossible, what prayer are you praying? I hope that's it. God, use me to do the impossible because we have a God like we're talking about at the beginning. He does miracles. He takes broken people and he makes them beautiful and he uses broken people, heals them and uses them to reach other broken people. Okay, so first service, uh, I was told after this next question, we're, they were greatly impacted because I heard uh, that after this question, after service, the reach table was like, crazy line to sign up for something, all right? Awesome. So I don't know if you knew that or not, but... I did not know that. So I'm going to ask you now, and I want you guys to hear as well, all right? What's coming up in 2019, okay. and what do I do if I'm interested in okay. going on a trip? So we have a lot of trips coming up in 2019. It's probably going to be about 12 to 15 trips. And in the spring, we have two coming up. These, Mexico and Cuba. Mexico is in March, and Cuba is in April. If you're sitting here and you're like, I'm ready to go right now, those are the trips for you. So get out there and sign up because we only have a couple weeks left, but there's still spots on both of them. Then this summer, we're going to go to Nicaragua and Cuba. And in the fall, we are going to be all over the world, okay? All right. We're so gonna, a year from now in the fall. A year from now, we're going to go to Guatemala, the Philippines, Togo, Liberia, Mexico, and Cuba. Wow. So, That's a big fall. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about it. I That's hope you guys awesome. are too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in going on a trip, you can do two things. Like Dave mentioned, you can go to the reach table. The other thing is all the trips are listed online and um, at the pointva.com slash reach countries. And if you're like, I know I want to go and I don't know which one, talk to us. You can even sign up. There's an undecided option, so you can put undecided and I'll help you figure out what's the best trip for you. Yeah, and who knows, maybe a year from now, God opens up another door and you're like, hey, come with me to this place. Yeah, you never know what's going to happen. Let, let me ask a follow-up question, and because many of you may be thinking this, right? We know missions trips can be very expensive, right? Because you have international travel, you know, it's it, plane tickets, and then we, uh, we take materials and we buy materials there to, to do the things like to build, to feed people. So um, is, is there a way I can go on a trip if I feel like I can't even afford it? Well, I think this is part of the asking God to do the impossible part. I've never seen anyone not go on a trip just because of money, because our God is a God who provides. And he does it in strange ways and unexpected ways, but we got to step out before he's going to provide. Like God's not going to give you a check for $2,500 before you commit to the trip, right? right? right. You got to commit to the trip and start moving forward. And then you see how God provides. Um, That's awesome. So we never want, we never want to hear and we're never even going to see money be an issue. No, I mean, we've trip. had some generous people within this church yeah. that have paid for entire people's trip and just said, this person's on my heart and I want to pay for their trip. Yeah, That's you awesome. Know? Yeah, I think about this, uh, one of my all-time favorite bands back in the day, Caveman's Call. They had this song called Two Weeks in Africa, and on, this verse always stuck with me. It's, a, it's like a song about a mission trip. 
they say maybe you've got money or maybe you've got time or maybe you've got a living well that's never running dry. And we all have something to bring. And so um, I want to share with you just for a minute about something we're going to do that's kind of cool and neat. We've never done it before. And so uh, I want to share with you now. We are going to take a week uh, coming up here. Uh, it's not today, but we're going to take a week, November the 26th, which is a Monday, through the following Sunday, December the 2nd. And we are going to designate all funds given to the point between November the 26th and December the 2nd. We're going to put it towards the nations. No questions asked. It's going to the nations. Now, just so you're aware, we already, in our budget every year, we already take 10%. Just the way God calls us to tithe and return 10% to him as a church, we do that as well. We already take 10% of, of everything that comes in every week, and we give it to, towards uh, reaching um, the loss, whether that's locally, domestically, through church planning, or, or internationally through um, reaching the nations. But everything... 100%. We're going we're gonna to take a week. Everything you give online, if you, re, if you have reoccurring giving set up uh, or you give online or you come to the service on December the 2nd, the Monday before that, November the 26th through December the 2nd, 100% of all funds given are going to the nations. And so we're going to ask you today to just pray about what God would have you bring to lay before him to reach people in Mexico, in Cuba, in Togo, Liberia, Guatemala, the Philippines, Peru, and to wherever else, and Nicaragua, and wherever else God may call us into the future. Because God doesn't need our money to do missions, but we can accelerate what we can do by bringing forth our best and laying it before God to reach the nation. So everybody good? November 26th through December the 2nd, bring your best to give to God, to reach the nations. And look, as we close today, I understand that there's probably some of you in here that you're hearing today about the gospel and the importance of the gospel and, and reaching the people, like when Amber told that story about that remote village in the Philippines or transforming that village or, or encouraging those in Cuba. And you may be wondering yourself, like, well, who is Jesus even to me? And because we recognize that just because we live in a, this very privileged nation, we don't all know Jesus. It's apparent even when you look around your family, friends, your neighbors, your enemies, not everybody knows Jesus. And so today, I don't want you to leave here without hearing who Jesus is because he is the son of the living God. That's what we tell the people of the nations. He's a son of the living God, that he came here. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And for our sins, which sin just means missing the mark. God has a mark. We missed it. For those reasons, we are separated from a holy and perfect God. But Jesus, God's son, came that we might be able to be restored unto him. And he did so by paying for our sins sacrificially on the cross, his body beaten, broken for us. But he didn't stay on the cross. And I got to stand up for this part. He didn't stay on the cross. All right. It says he was put into the tomb and three days later he was not found in the tomb anymore. They said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus raised to life. And that is why we can have access to God and be given the gift of eternal life. Because our Jesus is no longer dead, but he's the king raised in victory. And today, if you are separated from God or you don't know who that Jesus is, or maybe you've been distant from that Jesus for many years, today is your day of restoration, to be restored unto God for the first time by receiving his spirit and being pardoned for your sins and having and beginning a relationship with him. Or today is your day to, in faith, renew that relationship. Because I believe, as, as Amber said, Pastor Gabe's vision, which is for everyone here to go and experience a mission trip, an international trip, well, we got to get, we got to have something in here to pour out to others. All right? So let's all stand together today. And I'm going to pray over us that we might find that passion that for those that don't know God might know him today. And in a few moments, you're gonna have a chance to even receive that. We'll have a prayer team down front and we're gonna invite you into that as well. But can we pray together this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for the, the good news, God, the gospel, Father, that you love the world so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross, but to be raised to life. And God, that we can have that same spirit in us God, that, that he brought 
for the world. And so, God, I thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of Jesus, God. I thank you for the restoration that you give, that you offer the world, God. You offer it to us here. You offer it to the ends of the earth, as far from here as you can possibly be the same. God, you offer it the same. So, God, I pray right now, as you're touching hearts in this room, God, that those that are lost might be found in you today. God, those that have wandered off away from you, God, might be called home and returned unto you. And God, those that are seeking something might find it here this morning on this altar, God, laying their heart, their pride, their misery, whatever it is, God, that is keeping them from you, that they might lay it down today, Father, and find you. If you don't know Jesus today and you want to begin a relationship with him, I'm going to invite you just to confess your sin. The Bible says to repent and call upon his name. So God, I pray this morning, Father, that we can have a repentant heart. And today, if there are things you need to repent of, lay it down before Jesus. Just lay it down. And the scriptures say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will call upon his name today. Pray, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, fill my life. Jesus, let me walk with you. Let me begin walking with you daily, God. Replace the bad in me, Father, with the goodness of your spirit. And God, send us out, Father. Send us out to our neighbors down the street, God, and send us to the furthest places in this world that we might tell the lost of a good God that we know personally who is good. God, you are our victory. And we stand in victory today, Lord. And it's in your name that we pray together. Amen.